This week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with Tim Lozier of Ver Solutions about operational excellence and the culture of quality. That and more when we come back. Welcome back, everybody, to Quality Digest Live for Friday, March 24th, 2017. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest, and as you can see from my empty chair, uh, my partner Dirk Descharm is out. He's on vacation this week. Uh, we'll miss him, but we'll carry on anyway. And uh, we're going to start the show this week with a piece about something that uh, we always enjoy covering. This would be right up Dirk's alley if he was here. Uh, young people and STEM education. Well, you know, if you've never heard of the InVenture Prize, it's, it's quite a prestigious competition with a combined focus on engineering, innovation, and business. Uh, it's known as, I think, the American Idol for Nerds, I think is what it's called. It's just kind of a, kind of a funny, cool name. Uh, the program evolved from a collaborative effort by institutional leadership within the Atlantic Coast Conference. Teams of undergraduates representing each of the ACC schools present their innovative business ideas, which are judged according to the utility, practicality, and business impact of their projects. Now, as you, many of you know, I'm sure the ACC is, is well regarded for its, its strong athletic program, but it, it also boasts many of the leading research institutions in the country, if not the world, including the Georgia Institute of Technology, Duke University, Boston College, the University of North Carolina, and the University of Virginia, to name just a few. Really, I mean, if you look at it, all 15 schools in the ACC and the Atlantic Coast Conference are, are top-notch, are great, great in, in all areas, especially in, in research and, and engineering. So the ACC's InVenture Prize is an extremely competitive competition. It offers undergraduates the chance to sharpen their skills in the various facets of entrepreneurial activity. They compete for a total of $30,000 in prizes, so there's, there's a little skin in the game here. And the finals are going to be streamed live next week on March 31st, one week from today. As an example uh, of some of the types of projects that this competition offers, let's consider the winning team from, from Georgia Tech, who are going to the ACC InVenture Finals uh, this week coming up. Uh, this is a product that they call their Cautery Guard. That's what they won. It's a safer medical device used to stop bleeding and remove unwanted tissue. And their great innovation was to add a retractable tip, which prevents the risk of burns to patients and practitioners alike. Uh, the four members of the Cautery Guard team, which, which you just saw there a moment ago, uh, their names are, are Jack Corelli, Hunter Hatcher, Devin Lee and Dev Mandavia, there, there they are right there, four handsome young guys. Uh, they're not only moving on to the ACC InVenture Finals, but they've also received a place with Flashpoint. Now Flashpoint is a Georgia Tech business accelerator, so who knows, this invention, their quarter guard, might just kick off a, a great new medical device company from these uh, four young entrepreneurs that you see right there. Good, good work, guys. So for more information on the InVenture competition, you can check out the story link, just below this video player page right down there uh, and, and find out a little bit more about it. Uh, again, this, this type of thing, these competitions are springing up all over the place. Uh, really good stuff to encourage uh, entrepreneurship, uh, business excellence, um, innovation, all that good stuff. All right. Well, before we bring on our first guest on today's show, I want to ask you all a question about your organization's uh, culture of quality. Namely, when it comes to opportunities for improvement, do you do what's required or do you do what's desired? That's a pretty interesting little, little question there. I mean, you know, is it just you're doing what you have to do or are you doing what you want to do to improve your organization? And I think if most of us answered honestly, we'd say that we spent a lot of time just filling, fulfilling requirements, particularly when it comes to the pursuit of the range of financial, governance, sustainability, and, and quality-based activities that can really broadly be considered as compliance to a given standard or regulation. When you think about it, however, the value in achieving these various operational excellence activities comes less from checking off boxes or passing an audit or getting a certification, and more from the actual improvement of your processes, not to mention your enterprise as a whole. Now, that's the topic of a webinar that we're hosting in conjunction with Verse Solutions this coming Tuesday, March 28th, titled Achieving Operational Excellence, How to Create a Culture of Quality for Desired Outcomes, and you can see it right there. It will present some options for you to consider in moving past the realm, excuse me, the realm of mere requirements 
and into the world of real sustainable improvement. Presenting that webinar will be Tim Lozier, Director of Product Strategy at Verse Solutions. And Tim is with us now to offer a little sneak pre preview of that presentation. So Tim, welcome back to Quality Digest Live. Hey, Mike, you're getting all choked up there. I I'm guess getting, you're really I'm, emotional about this. I'm getting all choked up. You know, I, 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 I'm talking a lot. Usually Dirk interrupts me and says, let me say something. But in this case, I'm, I'm doing it on my own. But I got you now, so that's great. You can, you can interrupt me. Uh, so let's start with an easy one. Maybe it's an easy one. Why yeah. do you think people settle for compliance when, when it's clear that what they really want and need is excellence? Yeah, you know, I, it's funny because when we, just like you said, you know, when, when you think about what we are doing in, um, in our daily activities and we think about compliance, it's really about kind of doing the homework, what, what's required of us. So you want to make sure that you're doing exactly what fits within your standards, your frameworks, um, anything of that nature. Um, and I think when companies uh, focus a lot of their attention on that, they miss a part of this whole operational excellence thing. And I think operational excellence as a term um, tends to get kind of muddied when you start to say, well, what exactly is operational excellence? And I really like the idea of, of saying, you know, it, it really means um, compliance is what, what's required of us. It's what we have to do to make sure that we meet whatever standards we have. But operational excellence is putting in place the mechanisms and the elements to go beyond just what's required because we still have to do that. But it's also about looking for efficiencies and looking for ways to impact change and create a culture and make sense of the data to really get to a desired state where we're actually really improving the business with respect to how we're meeting those needs. You know, as many of us have learned uh, the hard way, there, there's a difference uh, between you know, what you can consider maybe gathering data and interpreting reality. Uh, you refer to something you call the single source of truth, which I thought was a great term. Can you explain what that's all about? Yeah, so you know, data is a tricky thing, and and I think what a lot of companies find is that um, you have a lot of information that's coming into your uh, world, your your world in general, but certainly in your professional world every day, and. Um, whether you're getting it from various different stakeholders in the business, very different, various different areas from a, a business technology standpoint, you're collecting all this data. And if you don't have it all in one place, um, you're going to have trouble actually understanding what the real truth is. Um, it goes in two fashions. I mean, if you think about it um, from a data collection standpoint, how many places do you need to go um, to find the data you need to make better decisions and really uh, meet your metrics versus having one single place. Um, so the single source of the truth is really just saying, how can we devise a central place, a hub, for where all our data, at least with quality and compliance, where all the data kind of lives? And then it's that's the first challenge. The second challenge is, is okay, well, we have all this data, but without a means to make sense of it and make decisions on it, we really just have data. So I think the two elements become is a single source for every all the data and then a way to actually uncover the truth through metrics and reporting and uh, details that will, will actually impact your change to the business. I mean, if that data is siloed, I guess you, you maybe fall into, uh, <laughs> can we call it alternative facts? Um, you fall into yes. <laughs> this idea where you maybe you have different perspectives on things and different people looking at it in silos and maybe not really coming to a new conclusion about what the actual reality of your process is. Is that is that Sure, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, let's talk about culture. I mean, uh, culture obviously plays into all this, uh, especially in an organization in which change management and risk management maybe is, is just as important as quality management. Do you think that's true about, about quality? Yeah, uh, about, well, about I mean, I'm sorry. yeah, I mean, culture, especially in quality, if you look at the way um, the new standards are coming out and the way they're kind of positioning the organization with respect to quality, you're looking to enroll more stakeholders into the business, into the quality story. I, I like to call it the story of quality because there's a lot of facets to it. There's a lot of roles. There's a lot of pieces that come in. And just like you have with the data, you have certain levels of knowledge. It's almost like tribal knowledge from various different areas, operations, production, supply chain, um, even from executives that you want to tap into and you want to make sure that they are putting that information into the overall process. And so that's where culture really becomes an important part. 
The challenge there is really about who speaks what language in, in, in the context of quality. So you have to start thinking about what can we normalize in terms of our nomenclature and our terms um, to really promote a culture of quality without freaking people out and saying, I don't speak quality, I don't understand these quality terms. And that's where a lot of terms like you know using risk-based thinking comes into play. It kind of normalizes it across the business so that way people can understand, okay, well, I see these hazards that exist and they could potentially present a quality problem. I'm going to be involved with it. And so I think what an operational excellence mindset becomes is, you know, we're meeting the requirements, but are we involving all the right people and are we getting the other areas of the business to look at the risks that might impact quality, that might impact our efficiencies, that might drive us to need more change in, in the organization for continual improvement. And I guess that those, those uh, challenges are multiplied, obviously, when you go outside your own four walls. I mean, sure, there's a lot of suppliers and, and even other divisions, maybe, of your own company, your own enterprise that are outside your four walls that you have to interface with and kind of get on the same page with. Absolutely. Yeah, I would imagine that would be the case. Well, how about maybe some of the unique challenges of, of small and, and medium-sized companies uh, in moving away from uh, that requirements and, and compliance mindset you mentioned? Yeah, and, and this one this one becomes pretty important because if you look at a company who is uh, just starting on their compliance journey, their quality journey, they are learning to implement systems, they've kind of decided to get into this area where they're able to consolidate and put um, all their requirements, their processes into a singular system, they're still in that compliance mode and they're still just saying, I got I to gotta make sure my house is in order and make sure that I'm meeting the regulations, meeting the standards. And so operational excellence as a, as a concept tends to seem like a far reaching thing. But the truth of the matter is, and this is kind of what we're going to be talking about on Tuesday, is that there's a few core elements that you can actually put in place now and start thinking about that will set you up for, um, for going beyond what's required and actually going into that desirable state. And I think that's something that a lot of companies can benefit from is, well, I may not be on that, I may be still in that compliance mode and, and still trying to keep my requirements in, in line. But if I do this now, if I set myself up for the next level, when I, when I do mature my processes, when I do get to that next phase, I'll have everything in place to take it and get that desired outcome and really impact change as an organization. So it's very beneficial for small to mid-sized companies to start thinking about this, even if they can't wrap their head around it right now because they're so busy just complying. And scalability is a big issue as well, in many cases for these small and mid-sized companies, I imagine. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And well, in addition to what we just talked about and in the, in these topics, um, what are folks who are going to tune in next, next Tuesday, this coming Tuesday, going to learn uh, in the webinar you're going to present? Well, um, we're going to talk a lot about the differences between operational excellence and, and compliance and, and kind of some of the challenges that companies are facing. You know, we've done several market research analysis to kind of show where people's heads are at today. But um, the real meat of the presentation is going to talk about what are the four or five things that companies can do right now to set themselves up for going beyond compliance and moving into this operational excellence mindset. And I think that's gonna be really beneficial because you're, you're looking for something that's going to give you tangible things you can do to really implement, um, whether it's solutions or methodologies, implement ways to really set yourself up for the best possible outcome, the most desirable outcomes, and really provide an impact on your quality operations to the rest of the business. Well, the rest great. you'll have to stay tuned for. So <laughs> I'm not going to spoil any more. We're looking forward to it. And again, that's, that's Achieving Operational Excellence, How to Create a Culture of Quality for Desired Outcomes. That's the webinar coming up this coming Tuesday, March 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Tim uh, right there is going to be presenting and yours truly will host and field your questions. So Tim Lozier, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll see you on Tuesday. All right, Mike. Thanks. It's thanks. been fun. Thanks, Tim. Have a good weekend. And for all of you out there, if you're interested in checking out the webinar, uh, you can register right in Tim's most recent articles right down, the, the, right down there below the video player screen. You can also keep an eye on your email inbox. You're going to get another invitation to the webinar on Monday. A lot of you have already 
we're signed up and registered for that one. So, uh, so look out for your, your uh, email again and, and sign up for it early next week uh, if and when you get an opportunity. Should be a good webinar. As you can see there, Tim is a, a great presenter. He knows his stuff. Alrighty, well, we ran an article earlier this week, which uh, is edging, of course, into the political. We, we've done a lot of political coverage here this year. Um, and, and this one definitely has some political overtones and it's what we're gonna kind of sink our teeth into a little bit. The name of the article was What the Trump Administration Misses About Regulations. And it initially ran on the Conversation website. It was written by a gentleman by the name of Joseph Aldi, who is an associate professor at the Harvard Kennedy School a visiting fellow at the Resources for the Future Think Tank, a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research, and a senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So in other words, Mr. Aldi knows his stuff and more than just a little bit. The article, as you would expect, is a very well-written and closely argued piece offering some compelling evidence that when you really tally up all the economic and social costs and benefits, leaving business regulations in place may carry more value than rescinding them. It's interesting, many people have made that, ca that case, made that point. And Aldi makes a good case here, but there are some interesting counters to this argument as well. So to help me sort through the various angles of the story, I'm, I'm joined now by Quality Digest CEO, Jeff Dewar, coming to us from QD North in Seattle via Skype. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Mike, how you doing? All right, how Greetings are you from, today? Uh, cold and rainy Seattle. And cold and rainy Northern California, too. I think it's cold and rainy and <laughs> snowy probably in a lot of parts of the country today. Um, well, let's jump into this one. This is an interesting article with a lot of ramifications. I mean, the top line takeaway from all these pieces is that regulations are good, okay? Now, does that mean that businesses left to their own devices are inherently bad? Well, um, no, I mean, uh, reg Regulations in many different forms are adopted voluntarily by uh, companies and businesses. If you take a look at ISO 9001, that's very much a uh, self-imposed uh, series in some respects of regulations that companies voluntarily adopt. But granted, sometimes their customers force it upon them. Um, and then even just a company's internal policies and procedures are, in a sense, a form of regulation. So it's it's nothing new. What what when the federal government comes along, you know, they're one, mandating it, so it's really not your decision anymore. And generally speaking, it's for the benefit of, uh, you know, society at large, rather than the way you adopt a regulation or a policy uh, for your own particular benefit of your employees, your business, or your customers. Well, I mean, this stuff comes down to money, obviously. I mean, the argument is that it's expensive for companies to maintain some of these uh, regulations. Uh, certainly a lot of the environmental regulations are, are costly for, for some companies in certain uh, fields, certainly yeah. in the energy space. So, but the argument all these making is that the societal benefits of that are so much greater that you know, a few billion here or there for industry is a, is a great expenditure if it, if it you know, kicks off many, many billions of dollars for society. Is it, you think that's true? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he gives a great example in there, and if you can, Christopher, you can show that first slide. You know, he talks about uh, the reduction from the EPA uh, in 1990, the uh, acid rain reduction uh, program uh, that was put in a place to reduce the nitrous and, and uh, sulfur oxides. The, uh, I mean, just a dramatic decrease over the last uh, couple of decades, you know, and that program is estimated to cost industry somewhere around $2 billion. But the savings are to society uh, estimated somewhere around a hundred billion. So you're talking about a fifty to one return, and and you know it, it, it's always you can look at these things in a real sort of funny way. But you know the way that they score these in the Office of Management and Budgets and very much involved in coordinating this is uh, you know they cite uh, many thousands of uh, uh, less cases of uh, premature death. Uh, many thousands of less uh, non-fatal heart attacks caused by known uh, elements of, of acid rain. So there's a huge benefit to society here. And yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, because when people get sick, there is a lot of cost to society. I mean, we're having a, a fight right, as we speak right now in the Congress about, about health care. And, and I mean, certainly people that get sick more uh, cause more stress to the economy in terms of needing services. So. Yeah, it would make sense that there there are some savings there overall for society that would come from uh, from strict regulations in, in industry. 
Yeah, and I think one of the questions that comes up that makes it a little bit um, suspicious, especially to, in today's political environment, is that there's, you know, you, you and I both know, as everybody who's watching this uh, right now, we've we've at some point in our careers, probably many, many times in our careers, have been involved in, in justifying something, um, you know, where we approach it not from, gee, will this be beneficial, but where we've already decided on an outcome. And then we go and backfill the justification uh, for that particular known outcome. It's it's like that Japanese phrase that there's nothing more dangerous than a man with a hammer in search of a nail. Right. And and, and I think that's part of the suspicion that surrounds it. Sure, you can like Aldi comes up with this, uh, you know, cites this uh, this cost benefit of fifty to one. Uh, but you know, what about some of the other factors that might play into this? You know, making it more difficult for other electric utilities to adopt new innovations that might reduce uh, other things that create new jobs that create you know synergy in the economy and just a whole cascade of events uh, or possibilities that aren't even considered in that uh, cost benefit analysis yeah and barriers to entry too i mean you know there sure. there, there certainly is is a, a, a value to making it easier for businesses to be able to get into industry and be innovative, and, and maybe if those barriers were lower, their innovations on their own would lead to uh, reduction in some of these harmful emissions and other, other bad societal outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also very helpful to sort of look at the, uh, the perspective of history. You know, the, if you go back and look at uh, regulations, there's this, there's this feeling today that we've had this uh, like Vice President Pence talks about this avalanche of regulations that's coming out of Washington. Um, but if you look at what has happened from, say, 1970, and Christopher, if you can throw that slide up, uh, you can see the uh, uh, starting in 1970, there were uh, roughly just slightly over 400,000 uh, regulations. And, and they're not calling it they're not measuring regulations by this graph. This was by the uh, Mercatus uh, Center, part of the uh, George Mason University in Virginia. Uh, what they're doing is they're counting up in the Federal Code of Regulations the number of shalls and musts and shall nots and all this, and uh, you know, and, and attaching uh, the numbers to that. So in 1970, you know, about just slightly over 400,000, and then in 200, 2008, just when Obama came in. Uh, just in the mid uh, 900,000, 963,000, I believe. And then it just kept on going for the last, uh, you know, eight years during Obama's time uh, at roughly the same rate, roughly about an additional 15,000 sort of edicts per year. So, you know, it, it's, it, it actually has been on an increase, yes, but on a linear basis. Yeah, and, and what's interesting about that, maybe you can throw that one back up there, Christopher, because I think there's an interesting thing to, to note here is, this, I think, Jeff, is one example of bipartisanship in Washington. Because <laughs> if you look there, you can see the, the, the red graphs and the blue graphs that goes up pretty much evenly the whole time, you know? So this, this idea that Obama uh, greatly increased the, uh, the number of regulations, I mean, they increased, of course, but not really at a, at a rate at which was unexpected based on what had come before. So uh, that's by, bipartisanship. But I mean, th there, you know, there's some pros. I mean, I, I can look at this and you, know, you and I can argue it either way, but I mean, I, I can look at this and say, well, you know what? I mean, maybe it's not the government's role to be involved in this stuff. Again, maybe the better way to do it is to encourage organizations through market forces or through uh, other ways to, to comply. And I, I see a good point for that. I mean, sure, we don't, none of us really, I think many, many of us don't, want a bigger government. We want, we want you know, businesses to be able to be as unfettered as possible. So there's some, there's, some, there's some good arguments to be made for the fact that there are too many regulations. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And, and I think it, it also brings into the discussion you know, how you want your government to treat you. Uh, and uh, it can give you an example, uh, a very personal level. You know, we have offices in Seattle and also in Chico, California. And uh, when we uh, rented or leased our offices there uh, in Ken Chico, uh, you know, we sat down with the landlord. We found the office complex that we wanted. 
and we had a kind of hard-boiled negotiation and you know we scratched this out and lined this out and added this page and that and we ended up with I think 13 pages and we both signed and that was it and done uh, then we also have an apartment in Chico California uh, for uh, traveling employees and company guests and so on and you know we we sat down and there was a one inch thick sheath of papers of acknowledgement of the federal this and the asbestos act and the state of california this and you know it was just an endless uh, amount and then the actual lease was just like two pages that said here's how much you're going to pay and here's what the term will run to so you know in a sense they're saying uh, the experience in right there highlighted if you're a business you're on your own you know uh, but if you're you know a really stupid naive helpless consumer the government needs to step in and in you know really take care of you in that regard but the onus for all those regulations fell on the owners of that property and I asked the property manager how much time does it take you to shuffle through all this paperwork and she's hours and hours a week and you know and that directly affects the, the the cost of running that business and of course it's passed on in the form of increased rents Muda. I mean, yeah, it's, Muda. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's exactly Muda. I mean, you raised another point that we, we chatted about off, off air, this idea that, that half, I, I didn't realize it was this high, half of US citizens require a CPA or some professional to help them do their taxes each year. Uh, yeah. And that's incredible. I mean, th th it's just, it, it, it's what, uh, uh, there's a fellow at John Hopkins University, uh, uh, Mr. Tellis, he, he refers to uh, everything that has to do with regulatory requirements, including the IRS, uh, as basically it has amounted to a kludocracy. It's just a band-aids after band-aids after band-aids because it's, uh, so you end up with this very kludgy system and, and what happens is you've, you, it's easier because of the way our government is structured and the separation of powers and all this, that it's easier just to put a band-aid on top of a band-aid rather than just rip them all off and rewrite it with something clearer and simpler. And uh, to, like to your point that, you know, our tax system requires uh, roughly half of all our citizens to, to uh, seek professional help. Whereas in the UK, uh, hardly anyone needs professional help at a personal level uh, for their tax responsibilities. Well, I'll tell you the truth, when I think about my taxes, I definitely seek professional help because it drives me crazy. <laughs> but. Um, you know, it's, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's reality that what you're talking about here. And, and back to all these point that, and back to the, the Trump administration's point, this idea that there's a, a, a one in two out model where they're gonna get rid of two regulations for every new one they create. In theory, I mean, that can make some sense. All the points out that, well, if these regulations that the two that they get rid of are having societal benefits, you know, not so good because the new one may not come up to the level of those societal benefits. But, you know, in theory, I mean, if you look in the, the individual regulations closely before you terminate the two, maybe that can make some sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it forces you to look at it and, and analyze it. He's just making the case, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, it's like, if you were forced to choose between this thing that saved society for, uh, you know, 50 billion and another one, the 50 billion, and then another one came along that saved 100 billion, what are you gonna throw those two out? Uh, just you know, to, to so that you can implement this, one. and uh, I don't think anyone is, is is saying that at all. It's just forcing the issue to look at the the benefit. You know, like the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, and also the White House has an Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs office that does these analyses, especially any regulation that's going to cost over about a hundred million dollars. Started with Reagan's office, uh, Reagan's term, uh, when they instituted that. And what what they do is uh, is analyze what the the cost benefit ratio will be for any of these. And and the problem comes around is that after they've done this analysis, it's never looked at again. In other words, it's implemented and not looked at again. Um, and and and. Uh, it's interesting because uh, Trump may have gotten this idea from the Brits because starting in 2011, they had a one in, one out uh, policy uh, for their regulations and they liked it so much. Now they have a one in, three out uh, policy. And, uh, uh, you know, so it's interesting because, you know, in, in the Brits, they, they cited all these sort of arcane 
uh, regulations that they started realizing were there once they were forced to actually look into them. You know, they, they had this one that uh, said, uh, if you work at home in your own business for yourself, you need to abide by all workplace uh, safety and health laws. I mean, you're working at your house, you know. So, uh, you know, it does force you know, a kind of a hard-boiled look into these things make sense after they've been implemented, after you've got a few years of experience. No, no doubt, no doubt. Well, Jeff, we're going to leave it there. Stay with us, though, uh, before we wrap this one up, because uh, this is a topic we're going to be talking about, I think, with you and, and Dirk and I and, and our, you, our, our audience as well, going forward, uh, this issue of, of regulations and what the role of the federal government's uh, to be going forward. I think it's an interesting topic. Uh, before we close, though, I want to thank Tim Lozier of Verse Solutions for joining us on the show this week. And don't forget, Tim's going to be presenting a webinar with us this uh, coming week titled Achieving Operational Excellence, How to Create a Culture of Quality for Desired Outcomes on Tuesday, March 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. You can register via link in Tim's article or keep your eye on your email inbox and invitations going to be coming your way shortly. And, and, and thanks to you, Jeff, for joining us today, helping out from up there in Seattle. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Okay, Mike. Great always, to see you. We always appreciate it. We'll see you soon, Jeff. Thanks, man. And a quick program okay. note to all of you. No show next week. Both Dirk and I are away, but we'll be back at you on April 7th with a terrific show. we got some surprises on that show, so be sure to mark your calendar and check us out then. See you all. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon.